All right, look at Romans chapter 15, if you will. All right. And um, where we left off was in verse 26, 27, somewhere around in there. I'll just read 25 through 27, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Look at Romans 15, verse 25. But now, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time this morning, this beautiful Sunday morning here in California, where we can come together with those of like precious faith. Uh, to be encouraged, uh, first through your word and through the flesh and blood fellowship. We do thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who follow by way of the internet. We do pray for them that your word of your grace uh, comforts them as well. Uh, and, 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 and in their time of, of uh, need, Father, as they uh, seek to, to understand your word through, through our ministry here, we're, we're happy that they have that opportunity. We're happy to, to, to give them that opportunity uh, as we, by faith, Come together to study your word. Father, we just thank you for all this thing, all this time that we have together. We pray that it's beneficial to us and glorifying to you. And we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, last time we saw Remember the Poor, and, and what we saw was that Paul, as he's going uh, on his apostolic journeys, one of the things that he was conscious for to do, he says in Galatians 2.10, was to take a contribution, a financial contribution for the poor saints which are Jerusalem. Uh, remember who those poor saints were? They weren't just any poor in Israel. They were the poor members of the little flock. Remember the little flock. The ones who sold all they had during the Lord's earthly ministry and during the early part of the book of Acts before Paul was saved and the dispensation of grace began. When they collected as a commonwealth, Israel was a commonwealth, this little flock, as the dispensation of grace went on, all of those, all of that money they collected had disappeared. It, it had, it had, they had not disappeared, but they, they used it up, right? Then there was a famine as well uh, in the book of Acts, so forth. So the way God is going to provide for the little flock financially is through the saints in the body of Christ. All those Gentiles who were in all these churches. Let me get my map because I want to show you this. It'll help you see it a little better too. The vast majority of what, what's going on. This is Paul's apostolic journeys. Okay. Paul is talking about the Romans. But he's covered this whole entire area. This Asia Minor and so forth and in Europe. And he, when he established these churches in the book of Acts, he would then go back there and he would take up a collection from these Gentiles and then take it to the little flock. That's how God provided financially or carnally. We're going to see carnal is not a bad word all the time. In the context of here, it's a good thing. He's going to provide for their physical needs. Um, that's what we saw. Paul was taking this collection. Now notice in verse number 26 and 27. For it had pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia. Now, we're going to go to the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Let me show you here. Here, on, and by the way, if you're watching by way of the internet, there should be a map. If, so, if you have a Bible, or you can just click on an internet map of Paul Apostolic Journeys uh, on the computer, if, you, if, you're doing a, if you're on a computer. But even in your Bibles, something like mine, it has maps in the back of it. You can see here's Macedonia and Achaia. Corinth fits right on in there. So Paul is writing, by the way, he's writing the book of Romans, or Tertius through Paul, writing the book of Romans from Corinth, okay? So he's, he's already coming, he's in this area to take a collection, and he's going to go back, take it to the four states of Jerusalem, okay? He promised Peter that he would do that, Galatians 2.10. So that's where he's at. And we're going to see that in the books of First and Second Corinthians in a moment. So he takes it, this collection, look at verse 26. For it hath pleased them. You know, I didn't bring this up last time, but it pleased them. It's more blessed to give than receive. It, it pleased them. When they understand what Paul was doing and how God was using them to provide for the needs of other saints, the little flock that was on the earth at that time. They're not, we're going to talk about it later. This is a transitional thing they're doing. Uh, there's no little flock on the earth today. There will be in the future after the dispensation of grace. Today, your finances as grace believers go to grace ministry to provide for them. But 
not just they did it for Paul, but also as long as that little flock was there, the Gentiles would give a collection to take care of them. All right. Now it says they pleased these grace believers, these, these members of the body of Christ, verse 26, who were of Macedonia and Achaia, that, that region Paul was in, including Corinth, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are Jerusalem. That's the little flock. Now look at verse 27. He mentions it again. It hath pleased them verily or truly. See, something is working in these people's hearts. They understand the grace of God. You're going to see it when we look at first and second Corinthians. Verse 27. It has pleased them verily. But can I tell you, there was also a duty there. Look at the rest of that. And there what? Debtors they are. It was a debt that those Gentiles owed these members of the little flock, these Jews. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. For, well, look at this, for further explanation, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their, that's the little flock, what? Spiritual things, the things associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, even in Romans uh, chapter number 1, Romans chapter number 15 earlier, Jesus Christ, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Jesus Christ was promised not to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. He was a promise of God to the seed of Abraham and the Hebrew people, okay? Not to the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles are going to be blessed by Jesus Christ in the kingdom, who is a bride. <clears throat> but even today, the Gentiles get blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Because notice, uh, the, the, the Christ means Messiah, Israel's Messiah. Watch verse 27. For if the Gentiles have been partakers, they partook of there, that's the little flock spiritual thing, and that's in, in the blessings of Jesus Christ. There, what's that next word? Duty. This is the right thing to do. It's what's do them. It's what you owe them. Is to minister unto them in carnal things. Now the word carnal is not always a bad word. We're going to look at that in a moment. But what I want you to see, this issue of debtor, Paul uses this terminology a few times in his epistles. Go with me to chapter number one. We saw that this issue of a debtor. Go to Romans 1. My job is to teach you how the apostle Paul thinks about things with the mind of Christ. And Paul understood what it means to be a debtor, to owe someone. Let me show you what he says here in chapter 1. Verse number 14, Romans 1, 14. Well, start at verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let or hindered hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other, what, Gentiles. So Paul is telling the Romans, as we saw in chapter 15, he starts off the book. I want to come see you guys, but I have some other stuff to do. God has me going in order. Paul had to first evangelize and, 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 and get uh, converts amongst the Gentiles in these areas. Rome is way over here. So Paul hadn't gotten to Rome yet. He was hindered too. We've seen that, right? Uh, not only through ministry, but by Satan himself. And can I tell you, because Rome was the power of that day, the last place that Satan would want Paul to establish a grace testimony was Rome. In fact, I'll tell you this, Satan, he cares less about that there were believers at Rome. The word of God's grace had gotten out of there. He didn't want Paul there. Just on a small scale, I could see some things, I understand some things in ministry. You can have a little flock of people who believe the right by the word. But what Satan doesn't want, he doesn't want that thing to become a local assembly where where you get someone to teach and lead that thing. That's what he doesn't want. And so he can have a bunch of little scattered sheep there, but Satan didn't want the apostle Paul to make it there because he knew Paul would come and bless them and give them some establishment. In fact, Paul says he would look at verse uh, look at chapter number one. Well, look at chapter number one. Paul understood that although they had the gospel of grace, they knew the doc some of the doctrine. He understood that his very presence there would, would be the difference. Look at chapter one, verse ten. That's the importance of having a local assembly with a preacher, because there's some preaching that has to go forth. Look at verse ten. Make a request if by any means now at length I that's Paul <clears throat> might have a prosperous journey by <clears throat> pardon me. The will of God to come unto you. Now watch what Paul says in verse 11. For I long to see you. Here's the purpose. That I might impart unto you some what? 
spiritual gift. That's not spiritual gifts like supernatural gifts. The spiritual gift is the, the doctrine. And, and God wants that preaching to go forth, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation, the preaching. And Paul would, would do that. He was the one when, during his time that would do it the, the, the greatest. He says, <clears throat> to the end that ye may be established. Verse number 12, that is, that I might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So Satan understood if he can keep Paul from getting places, then he can slow down and hinder the edification of saints, okay? There was something about the presence of the Apostle Paul and the power of God's word working in him. Not just to give the word, but to be an example. It's interesting, that dynamic. Anyway, look at verse number 14, Romans 1. Paul understood something. I am, you see that word? Debtor. Both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. And he explains what that means. Both to the wise, the Greeks were the wise. Even though he's talking about the Romans, that Greek culture was the wisdom of this world. The wise of the world. And to the unwise, a barbarian to the Greeks was someone who didn't understand the Greek way. They were unwise. Verse 15. So as much as in me is... As far as the doctrine is concerned, he didn't have it all at that time. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. That issue of Paul being a debtor, here's what I see there. He owed it to them. Later in 1 Corinthians 9, we're going to see that when Christ gave Paul the ministry of grace, he told him, this is your ministry and you need to fulfill it. It's yours. And Paul had a choice. He could do it willingly, or he could do it unwillingly. But he was going to do it. If he did it willingly, he, he's going to get a reward. Thank God he did it willingly. But he was going to have to do it against his will. And if he did it against his will, if he's going to be compelled by Christ to do it, he wouldn't get a reward. That's an interesting dynamic. We'll talk more about it when we get there. I'll show you the verses. But the point is, he ended up doing it willingly, but he owed a debt. Uh, <clears throat> on the road to Damascus, when the Lord came down, he, he told Ananias about Paul. He is my chosen vessel. I chose him to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And Jesus Christ gave Paul that charge, and Paul had to fulfill it. Okay? In Colossians 4.17, I think it's 4.17, Paul tells Philemon's son, Archippus, you fulfill that ministry that the Lord gave you. Paul says, don't you be like Demas and them and just come so far and not fulfill and lose reward. You fulfill it. And, 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 and each of us, we need to fulfill our course, run our race, to get our reward. But Paul was unique. He, it was his message, it was his message, his ministry, and he was going to fulfill it. Willingly or not? We'll, we'll see that. So he's a debtor. Let me show you one more time the word debtor is used in Romans. Go to Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. This is in context of your sanctification, your, your walk. You don't owe the flesh anything. Look at Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 12. We just jump right into context. By the way, Ryan has posted Romans 8 studies from our previous time. We were chapter 15 a few months back or whatever. So I, I went into detail. But let me just jump right in. Look at Romans 8 verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we were fled. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Speaking about that word of Christ, the spirit of God dwelling, being at home. It's different than just being Indwell, to dwell, okay? This is something that, this is a sanctification issue of built up doctrine in you, okay? But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, what? Quicken, we've been seeing this in the Ephesians study on Wednesday, quicken your mortal body. This body that's subject to death because of sin, you can have power over that sin if you're constantly doing the work of faith and believing the word of God through Paul, building up power in order to quicken, make alive your mortal or subject to death flesh. Look at the rest of that verse. Also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, so let's say you do the work of faith, you build up the doctrine of grace. Sin no longer has dominion over you. 
Therefore, verse 12, brethren, we are not what? Debtors. Excuse me. We are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. The point is, because of what Christ did in our spiritual baptism, He made us dead with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We were raised together with Christ. We have the power of Christ if we build up the Word. And you don't have to let the flesh run you. You don't owe the flesh anything. <clears throat> you owe the Spirit something. And that's to, by faith, live by the grace of God. Okay? So we don't owe the flesh. We're not debtors to the flesh. One more. Go to Galatians 5. I like this one. Look at Galatians 5. I'm going to teach what Paul talks about being a debtor. Because there's another debt you owe. If you're going to try to live your Christian life based upon a performance-based exception system that's not great, law or religion, denominationalism, whatever you want to call it, performance-based, whether it's the law of Moses in their day or today, Messianic Jews try to keep the, so-called Messianic congregations try to keep the law. I was on uh, Howe Avenue near Arden Way. There's a, <laughs> it's, it says, the law of Moses Messianic congregation. <laughs> And I was just laughing. I'm like, these goose trying to keep the law. <laughs> How are you going to try to keep the law? You're not, you're not in Jerusalem. You don't have a temple. But let me show you something. <laughs> There's also one. I drive my, my uh, seniors around so I see this stuff. There's also one on uh, Man- <clears throat> not Manzanita, but where Manzanita <clears throat> turns into Pharaoh's right about Marconi. There's a, con- there's a Jewish congregation. And what I know about them, they always go into the law and they want to try to keep the law. Not knowing you got to be in Jerusalem in the temple. But, that, that, you know, let's not get complicated with the word. Um, look at Galatians chapter number 5. Notice what Paul says here, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore. He tells the grace believer. First book, Paul wrote Galatians. Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. The law is bondage. Grace is freedom and liberty. Not freedom to sin, but freedom to serve. It's one thing to be free, to take the shackles off, but it's another thing to use that freedom to serve the Lord. That's what liberty is. Uh, I remember about three years ago, three or four years ago, I did a conference with Brother Richard Jordan, and he asked me to talk about stand fast in the liberty, where Christ has made us free. And, and being an African American, you know, our, the reason we're here today is goes back to slave days and stuff. So I started thinking about that. And when the slavery was abolished and Emancipation Proclamation and so forth, a lot of the slaves who were freed went back to live with their masters. And the reason why is because where are they going to go? What are they going to do? They, the masters still had this mindset that they were slaves. Okay, they were forced to set them free. Well, then what? What are they going to do? That's where that whole thing with 40 acres and a mule came from. Because they say, you need to give them some land, give them some, you know, to, some help to work the land. Because if you just set someone free, I think about it, my daughter, she, she's, a bond well, that well, that's, uh, that's a whole different thing. Okay. The way slavery was, no, that wasn't bond servant. Okay. A bond servant was allowable in Israel under the law. Slavery was not. That was punished by death. Paul calls that, First T- Timothy 1, man stealing. Mm-hmm. When you take a man in slavery, that was, Every one of them who had those slaves should be put to death, God said. But you know, we're not going to complicate matters with the truth, right? So here's my, uh, no, it's okay, that's okay, no, this is good. So what happened was, they set the guys free, they set the, 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 the slaves free, but then where are they going to go? What are they going to do? It'd be like at 18 years old, my daughter says, with that, I don't want to be under your house no more, I'm going to be free. I said, okay. Take up. I can see that too. <laughs> Hopefully the word of God. Hey, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, the word says. But the rod of correction drives it far away. <laughs> you know, in fact, basically Solomon said, you just beat the hell out of them. You beat the hell out of them. No, don't beat them. You know what I'm saying. Give them a little. But I'm, that's what he said. He says, if you don't, you hate your son. It won't kill him. That's what the word, word said. Don't, don't, don't abuse them, but you give them a little, you know. It's foolishness bound in that heart, and the rod of correction drives it far away. Mm-hmm. Have you a little rod of correction. Don't do it with your hand. There's a little rod. We could use a little spoon, a little wooden spoon, stir spoon. And she knows the rod of correction. All right? But this issue of, they, they set them free, but there was no place for them to go. So what did they do? Many of them went right back into the, that's all they knew. 
Uh, it's a little bit of that, like when you set a prisoner free. Free. They want to go back. A lot of them like to go back. The recidivism. Why? Because if you spent 20 years incarcerated in prison, you become, that's who you are. And they say, hey, you're free. So a lot of guys go back and they realize, nothing out here for me. I'm a felon. Nobody want to hire me. Nobody want to do anything. Well, I'm free. Let me rob a bank or something. Hopefully I get the money. If not, I get caught. I just go back to my life. So really not free. Liberty is this. When God told the people of Israel to free, you know, their brother from the bonds of, um, of their debts, you not only let them free of the debt, you give them something, some land and so forth, so they can go and live. Well, that's what the Christ shed blood would do for the believer. He says to stand therefore in the liberty. Oh yeah, let me finish this, sorry. Got to If my daughter at 18, she's legal, she say, Dad, Mom, I don't want to live on your rules, I want to be free. I say, okay, fine. You got free will. Take all those clothes off. Get naked. What do you mean? I bought them clothes. Get naked. Here's the door. Get out. Close the door. You want to be free? You don't know. Can't keep you. But everything you have is mine. Go be free. You know what you're going to do? Don't want to come back. Just go ahead and have it. Okay. Don't, don't be playing games with your parents. You smite your parents. You, you curse your parents. You die under the law. Because your parents are God in your life. So these people let, the world lets their children run them. You don't let, my grandmother was like that. She said, if you want to be free, take all your stuff, everything you got is, is, is mine, get out. And you know what children do who want to be free? They say, sorry grandma, sorry mama, you know, come back in. Well that's what God did. He'll let you free. Because if you want to be under bondage, what you think is freedom is really bondage. My daughter wouldn't survive a day at like 18 years old on her own. Her life is in me and her mother and you guys and her family, her parents, the grandparents and family. Well, look at the life that we as believers have. Verse, verse one. Stand fast, therefore. Look at the end of verse chapter four. So then, brethren, verse thirty-one. So then, brethren, we are not children of the what woman, bond woman, but of the free. See, members of the body of Christ, we're not under that law like Hagar and Jerusalem down there at Queen Paul's day on the ground. We're, we were, we were the, the children of, of Abraham by faith and that Jerusalem which is above, the free one. And because of that fact, therefore, won't you stand fast, verse 1, chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. It's not just getting out and having no place to go. It's getting out and having a, a land, a, a life to live in Christ. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where with who? Christ has made us free. Who made us free is the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he accomplished on the cross. And and stand in that preaching of the cross. That's the Pauline revelation of grace. Verse 1. And be not, what's that next word? Entangled. Paul uses this. I read the pastoral epistles because they apply uh, particularly to me personally as a, as a minister. 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. But he says in 1 uh, Timothy, no man that war, excuse me, Second Timothy 2, he says, no man that war entangled themselves in the affairs of his life. And here's what my, I picture in that. Some days, uh, my wife hates spiders. And the Bible says that those spiders can get into king's palaces, man. You can have armed guards, you can't stop spiders. You look up, there's a spider web in the morning. You just looked there last night, there wasn't. Or we walk through the door and a spider web hits you in the face. Well, that's what I think about. To be entangled means you just walked into this web. We saw this wonderful web that this, I think it was a black widow, it was fantastic. It's, it's actually very artistic how God made them, right? Some, some, some crazy, not crazy, I mean, that's just in them. Some guys, some, some, some lost guys, um, professor, I don't know what to call them, they, they some, they're, they're working in, in some college here in, in California, some university, and they're studying the webs of spiders. But here's why. They said, the silk that these spiders weave, they're just taking God's creation. They said, look, it's so tough. Like, this little creature can make this intricate silk that's really tough for the, for the, he says, if we can harness that, so they want to genetically make this stuff. Well, God wants man to do that. You know, look at the creation and wonder how that little creature creates all of this silk web. And man can harness that. God made us to do that, okay? For his glory. You know how they did it? They, they genetically modified goats to have spider oh. come out as 
That is, see, you see what man can do? Man can do wonderful things because we created the image and likeness of God. And God wants us to use that creation for good and honor him and say, hey, look, Lord, thank you for putting this into a spider and we can do all this stuff. Because ultimately then you can make enough, a certain material, right, that can help man. But you know what lost people do. They do and say, look at us, Nobel Peace Prize, whatever, you know. Don't give God the glory. But that's interesting, Ryan, that they do that. Or even if they use it for, you know, some innovation for good, they don't give the Lord the glory. That's what it means, you know. Anyway, that entanglement. And whether you're a minister, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life at all. But I would say if you are a grace believer, don't get entangled. Because what happened is Satan, he has a course of this world we saw in Ephesians that wants to entrap you. And just like when you walk through that, by the way, you don't even see that spider web most of the time. You walk in, and you've got some things like that. You don't even see it. Well, Satan works that way in this world. You're just walking right into his trap if you don't listen to Paul. And you know what happens? You've got that spider web all over you, and it's all over you. Well, the world is like that. And if you don't beware and listen to Paul, you'll just walk right into that spidery trap. Well, can I tell you another spidery trap Satan has? Not just this world system, but religion. Because look at verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled. What's that next word? Again, many of us come out of religion. (coughs) Many of these Galatians, it was a mixed crowd of Jews and Gentiles, right? He went there in Acts 14. Many of those Jews, like Paul was, like, like the Apostle Paul was, they grew up steeped in Judaism. Speak in the law. And Paul says, don't let that be what you focus on as a member of the body of Christ. Don't focus on law, focus on grace, focus on my doctrine. Watch this. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the law. That's what the, the law represents. You know what a yoke is? It's a harness to serve. Duty. It's a duty. But you know what, Dorothy? When they had oxen in Israel, the beasts of burden that plowed the fields, when a new oxen was was ready, they would yoke it with its mother or father. They put that yoke around both of their necks, and the the trained one would teach the untrained one, you know? The law is like that. It was training Israel to bring them to Christ, schoolmaster. But we don't need that today because we have the doctrine of grace, Pauline truth. And when you put yourself under the yoke of bondage, you're allowing the law to take you where, where it wants to take you. And that's just condemnation and death, right? Second Corinthians 3. So don't be yoked in that bondage. Don't be harnessed. By the harness to serve, you're going to serve the law and not God. Verse 2. Behold, I who? Paul. Man, when you see I, Paul, that is a distinct Pauline truth. Let me tell you this. I say unto you, that's the body there. That if ye be circumcised, now that was the religious system of his day, represented the law. Christ, okay, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall what? Profit you how much? No thing. No thing. <laughs> the religious system today will have the unsuspecting simpletons thinking that if they just do whatever the pastor says do in religion, not, 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 I'm to, I'm to tell you to do what Paul says, his commands, but they have, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, what James says, what Hebrews, all this stuff, don't write me the Bible. They have you thinking that you're doing stuff to please God and that you're going to profit from Christ. And Paul says, Christ will profit you nothing. Verse 3. Okay. For I testify again. Had Paul told, told them this in Acts 14? You bet. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a what? Debtor to do the whole law. If you come to God and says, God, forget about grace. I am going to walk, not by faith, by the way, I am going to walk in religion, denominationalism. He says, okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's see how you do, but you're better to do the whole thing. What does James 2.10 say? If you keep the whole law and yet offend in how many points? One point, you're guilty of all of it. 
And so at the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will say, all right, let's see how you did under that law system. Here we go. He looks, no fruit. All right. Say, say so it's by fire, but you get no reward. That's the problem. Look at verse 4. Christ has become of what type of effect? No effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, and the way Paul uses that justified there, he's not talking about saved, he's talking about your saint, you, you know your walk. You're going to say, I'm walking righteously before God. You have fallen from what? Grace. Grace. You have a standing in grace. Why in the world would you then go and say, I'm going to perform under the law to please God? Look at, look at verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And remember, we don't owe the flesh, right? Romans 8, 12. But by love, do what? Serve one another. Can I tell you, you don't have to serve the law or your flesh. But you do have to, by love, serve one another. Jim, we were talking about the Lord's Supper, and we, we, we give some clarification on that. The way the Corinthians were doing it, they were serving their own selfish needs and desires. 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says, no, you need to carry one for another and love serve one another. That's how you please God. You serving other saints in the grace message, okay? And there's different ways to do it, but you understand you serve one another. All right? All right, so we see what a debtor is. It means to owe someone. Go back to chapter 15 of Romans, please. Go to Romans 15. I like to let you see how Paul thinks about these certain things in his epistles. You need to know that. All right, here we go. Look at the rest of that passage. Look at verse 27 again. It hath pleased them verily, speaking of the Gentiles at Macedonia and Achaia, and their debtors they are. They owe this to the Jews. Here's why. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their, that's the little flock, spiritual thing, those are the things of Jesus Christ, their duty, or the thing that's right, what's due them, is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Now let me explain carnal. When we think of carnal, we think of the carnal Corinthians, right? Well, at least if you've been around Christian circles and so forth, when you think about carnal, fleshly, sins of the flesh, you think of the Corinthians, carnal means fleshly, think pertaining to the flesh. But sometimes, and we'll go to 1 Corinthians to show you this, the issue of carnal doesn't necessarily, is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Earthly? Right, it, it's, it's earthly, physical, literally the word means pertaining to the flesh. Carne asada, you know, flesh of, of, of the, the meat. Uh, Jesus Christ, his incarnation. It's Jesus, the word of God in flesh, right? So it, it, carne in itself means flesh, a carnal. But everything about the flesh is not bad. God, we have, we have flesh to serve God. If you're doing the sins of the flesh, that's bad. But if you're taking care of someone else's flesh, I say it's taking care then that's good. Notice how it's used here, and then we're going to see in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, the carnal people. Uh, verse, verse 27, at the end, their duty is also, the Gentiles' duty is to minister unto the little flock in carnal things. He's not saying, you know, help them sin. He's saying that in this context, go to 1 Corinthians 9. So in the book of the, the carnal Corinthians, the bad Corinthians, Paul actually used the word in a good sense. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 9. Does it mean money or finance? In this particular case, yes. But it's more than that, mother. I mean, you got it's it's anything. It means to provide pr provision. Let me show. Let me put it on the board here. Provision. Um, it's any provisions for the physical needs. It's providing for. So here, in the good context, carnal. You see the word carn, carne. It's it's pertaining to. Pertains to flesh. We're, but in the good context, it's providing for fleshly or physical need. Yeah, necessity. Exactly. 
Romans 15, 27, and there in this passage, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Paul, you can read the context. He's getting on the Corinthians for not taking care of him as their minister. You know, to take care of the minister, the ministry, that type of thing where you're getting fed the word of God. And Paul was feeding them spiritually. Keep that in mind. And they were supposed to provide for his physical needs and necessities. Because watch what Paul says. Verse number 14. After he explains that they would understand that that temple that was still up, the Levites, you remember last time on on our Ephesians study, we saw that the Gentiles robbed God of his glory and so did Israel. And the way that Israel robbed God, not only in the idol worshiping, but the temple of God where the Levites were, the Israelis were to bring in their tithes and offerings, right? Remember that, Malachi? And because of that, God's chosen tribe weren't taken care of. The glory didn't shine from it. They weren't taken care of. And God said, you're robbing me by not bringing the meat to the storehouse of my temple. Tithes, so forth, okay? They weren't providing for the physical needs of his ministers, the Levites. That's what he's saying. Well, the same is with, with Paul. So he talks about that stuff about taking care of the, the, the temple. God took, provided through, through the needs of the thing. Look at verse 14. Even so, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. You preach the gospel, you, you're going to live or, or be taken care of by that ministry. Verse 15. Now Paul, because of the Corinthians carnalism there, they're them being babes in their understanding because they didn't listen to Paul. Watch verse 15. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. For it were better to me to die than to any man should make my glory and void. Verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. You remember we looked at chapter 1 of Romans? I am debtor both to the Greeks and so forth. Because Jesus Christ gave Paul this ministry. Watch what he says. Verse 16. For though I preach the gospel of grace, he's talking about, I have nothing to glory of. He's saying, I'm not doing anything that I ought not to be doing. Christ gave me this ministry. For, you see that word necessity? Later when we see how to give, he's going to say, not grudgingly or necessity. He needed to do this. For necessity is what? Laid upon me. You see that word laid? The Lord burdened Paul with this. He put it on. <laughs> laid upon. Actually, that is the word like, like you got a beast of burden, right? A little a, a, a ox. And you put that load right up on him. Don't don't look at my the way I'm drawing it. That's the burden right there. Alright, yeah, it looks like a crazy little beetle or something. That that's supposed to be an uh, an ox. Well Paul was that in fact it, it says Thou shalt not muzzle the ox which treaded out the corn. So that's exactly, okay. You put that burden. That's called the gospel of grace. That was on Paul. He better walk it out, man. Plant the seeds, you know, do the harvest. My point is, that was what was laid on Paul. Acts chapter 9. All right, here we go. Verse number 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a what? Look, look, look up here real quick. We've been talking about this for I don't know how long, constantly. We're talking about a reward. When you fight a good fight, when you finish your course, when you keep the faith, the doctrine, you get a crown of righteousness, that reward. Not just Paul, but you and me if we stay faithful. Okay, keep going. Verse number 16, but something different with Paul. He goes, yay, woe is me. Woe, there's going to be some punishment. If I preach not the what? Gospel. Or there's going to be some accountability there. Consequence. Verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a... There's the reward again. Yet, excuse me, but if against my will, get this, a dispensation of the gospel, what? Is committed unto me. What Paul is saying is, that's my job. I have to do it. I'm going to do it willingly or not, but I'm going to do it. Christ can compel him to do it. Now, go down with me this issue of carnal. 
verse number, oh, my spot there. verse 11. If we have sown unto you, what type of things? Spiritual things. The we there is Paul and his ministers. The under apostles un, uh, under him and so forth. The ministry. Verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your what? Carnal, Carnal things. He says, it's no big deal if you provide for us. We're, we're providing spiritual. By the way, those two are of opposition. Spiritual and carnal. He uses it over in Romans 15, 27 and here. So if, if carnal is the things pertaining to the flesh, spiritual is things pertaining to the what? Spirit. The spirit. The spirit of God in this context. All right? So as you can see, these just juxtaposition, carnal, spiritual, physical, spiritual, flesh, spirit. And what Paul is saying is if, if someone, if you're being ministered to the spiritual word of God, or if you're being provided spiritual needs, then you're providing physical needs. So that's what he's saying. I want you to see he does use carnal in a positive way, both in Romans 15.27, uh, positive. Rom- Romans 15.27 and here in 1 Corinthians 9. Look at verse 12, by the way. This is the worst part about it. Can I just tell you something? Paul was giving them the truth. Other men were giving them the, Satan's lie, denomination, religion. Can I tell you what these saints did? They were paying money. And Mother, you asked the question, yes, in the context it was money, but also physical needs, clothing, food, I mean, whatever the needs. But if you get money, then you can get, take care of them. Here's my point. They were paying money to men who were lying to them. They're doing that now. They're doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta rent this little we gotta rent this little bitty hole in the wall, which is fine, it's just a building. And all of not, they got building funds where they build massive structures with millions of dollars. That money should be going into the truth, to the grace message. Yeah, yeah. The Corinthians, look at verse 12. If others be partaker of this power over you, are not we the Paul is trying to explain to them, you guys are paying your 10,000 instructors in Christ, 1 Corinthians 4. I am your father spiritually, and y'all, you're not even taking care of me. And in the context, those under him. Here's what he said. Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Paul's going to suffer. And he said, the Lord watch it. And because of that, I'm going to get a greater reward. You know, it's going to fruit that out of my account. But it's going to be taken away from them. An opportunity to take care of the needs of the ministry was there. They didn't fulfill it. It wasn't fruit that abounded. So I want you guys to see that carnal in context of first of First Corinthians nine and Romans fifteen is not a bad thing. Okay, most time it's bad, but in this case it's not. All right, let's uh, go back to Romans chapter fifteen, if you will. So I want to make this real clear that what Paul was doing to hinder him from going to Rome. He was taking care of the needs of the Jerusalem saints. Okay. Look, look with me in verse number 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, of the little flock, their duty is also to minister to them in carnal things. Now, the issue of the carnal things. With the time we have left, you have about 10 minutes left. I want you to get familiar with Pauline truth. When I read these things, other verses come in and I go, oh, that makes sense why he would say what he said over here. So let's look at it together. You can leave Romans right now and go to 1 Corinthians, the next book, chapter 16. I always tell you, read Paul's epistles. Read them, read them, read them. Study them. Get them in your mind. God's goal is that every word that he wrote through Paul in Romans 2, 5, 11, we can know by heart. So until you know every word by heart, by memorization, you keep reading. I confess, I don't know every verse by heart. Almost. Almost, <laughs> but I don't know every verse by heart. Yes. But that's my, that's, that's my own personal goal because I see that's what Paul wants. Here, here's, here's, the, here's the point. I know that when the Lord Jesus Christ judges me at the judgment of Christ, he's looking for his word in me. 
And if I can know and memorize every word that he wrote through Paul, Romans 1 through Philemon, verse 25, and that's my goal, that's my own personal goal, then I know that as I, and I believe it, by the way, you got to believe it too, just not know it, but believe it. I know if I know all, see, you know what the Jews did? They wanted their sons to know every word of the law. The man shall not live by it. You know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeded out of mouth of God shall man live. Deuteronomy, and then the Lord quotes it. Jesus Christ was the word. The word became flesh, but during the time of his sojourn in those 30 plus years, the flesh became the word again. Jesus Christ knew every single word of Almighty God through Moses. and Whatever his Old Testament was, Genesis through Chronicles, he knew every word perfectly. Now he's perfect. But that's what we're, Paul is telling us to do that too. And until you do that, you need to do that. Make that your own personal goal. Make your personal goal to know Romans 1 verse 1 all the way through Philemon verse 25 perfectly. That'll give you something to do with your life. You'll never be bored. Do it while you're young. <laughs> Thank you. Our wise elder stateswoman, Dorothy, at 82, I just turned 41 on Wednesday, so we thought, you, we, I'm half your age. I'm going to take that advice. Do it while you're young, right, Dorothy? And if you're younger than 41, you, you're in a better position. You do it while you're young. But Dorothy is doing it. 82, she's, she's redeeming the time. So until you got that, by the way, once you can memorize, because some people have eidetic memories where they can remember everything. I can almost remember everything I read if it's, if it's worth it if, to me. But then, you can know every word of the Bible, like Jack Van Empey, and not know the mystery. Because <laughs> you got to rightly divide it and believe it. I want Jack Van Empey's memory, maybe when I'm his age, what is he, about 80? He, he never, he, he recorded a lot in Ephesians. Well, well hey. because he, he does know every verse. So, yeah. you know, I don't know how old the guy is, maybe he's in his 70s. In 30 years, I think I'll know verses, at least I'll know every verse in Paul, I hope. But see, here the difference between me and Jack. Jack doesn't rightly divide. Jack doesn't understand the mystery. Although he knows the verses, he doesn't believe it and therefore he doesn't understand it. So once you now know every word, Romans 1 and Philemon 25, then you want to be make sure you understand it. <laughs> That's a whole different story. So we got a lot of work to do is my point, okay? He's 82. He's 82. Oh. And he forgets the half last Oh, I'm half his age. He's your age. Oh. Oh, Dorothy, can I tell you something? You and Jack the same age, and you don't know every, all the verses like Jack, but you know more than Jack. You understand the right way to buy the word. You understand what God's doing. That's more important to God. You think that impresses the Lord Jesus Christ that Jack knows all those verses and yet does nothing? Yea, he evil worker to oppose the mystery? He wants you, Dorothy, somebody who Jack says, you don't know as much verses as many verses as Jack, but you know where the truth is. Now, I can catch Jack in 41 years with the Lord tears. That's right. That's what I'm going to do. But look, when you read Paul, you come to a verse like this in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, you go, hey, what's going on? Romans 15 just told us. Look at chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning the collection for who? All right, the saints. Now, from our study in Romans, we already know who those saints are. Who are those saints? The little flock. The, the four saints of Jerusalem. See, you might think, oh, he's talking about the saints in the body. No, we already know from context, Galatians 2, Romans 15, it's the four saints at Jerusalem, uh, excuse me, at Jerusalem, little flock. All right. Remember Paul says, I'm out there in Macedonia, Achaia. He's now talking to the Corinthians and saying, hey, take that collection. Here we go. Now concerning the collection for the saints, the poor saints of Jerusalem, as I have given what? Order. order. This is an order from the, from the Lord through Paul. To the churches of Galatia. So now we know through, through this that the Galatians, here's Galatia, that this territory Paul was collecting, that's why I told you he's all, collecting all through here. You don't know that until you read this, but I knew this first, see? Now watch this. Verse number one, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. By the way, you can find that order in Galatians 6, verse 6. Acts 11, 2. And then Acts, yeah, we can, it's a lot of it, Acts. Verse number two. 
Here is Paul actually instructing how to give. This principle is how you're to give. Upon the what? First day of the week. Now, he said first day of the week, but let me bring it to where we are today. What's the first day of the week, on our, at least in our calendar? And Sunday. It's Sunday. That's why, that's, it's the resurrection. It's the first day of the week. That's when they worship the Lord. Look back. The reason why we, to this day in our culture, meet on a Sunday, the first day of the week, okay, to honor the Lord. We take that first day and say, Lord, I'm honoring you on this day. I dedicate the entire week by honoring the first fruits of the week, which is Sunday. Okay, here we go. Verse 2, upon the first day of the week, it's an individual thing, watch this, let every one of you lay by him in store. Here's what he's saying. You look over what the Lord has given you, we'll see that this week and next week, whatever that amount, whatever that is, and you say, you know, prayerfully, oh, we gotta, I'm going to take... This amount, whatever the amount is. It's between you and God. No preacher can tell you. It's between you and God. But you lay it in store. You put it aside. It's a put aside, okay? You say, oh, that's for the Lord. Okay? What's well, between you, your family, and the Lord? How it? Now keep reading. Verse 2. Upon the first day of the week. So you do it the first day of the week. week first day of the week. So week uh, each week. Okay? Weekly. First day. Sunday and our day, whatever. Just kind of just let you see how, what Paul says. Let every one of you, so it's an individual thing, lay by him in store as God has prospered him. So you understand that this right here is between, that's why I say it's between you and God, how God prospers you. God pros, prospers, okay? Well, how he provided. You say, Lord, everything I have, you provided, I'm going to give back. That's what you do, and that's between you and the Lord. As God has prospered him. That there be no gatherings when I come. Now in Paul's day, by the time he would get there to Corinth, he says, you guys do this. I'm going to be there in about a year. I think it was a year. We, we, we got to end soon, but if I'm, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll bring it up next week, it was about a year. So for 52 straight weeks, all those saints there gathered what they could so that when Paul came, now it's different today. They didn't have the first bank of current, you know. Well, I guess they did, but it was. Food well, it's not food. That's why it's money. That's another thing. Yeah. Like in Israel, when they couldn't bring, you, you said it, that tithe and offering from afar, they turn it to money. Then when they bring the money to Jerusalem, and then, okay, that's why they have money changes. Anyway. So here, now, it's a little different. You gotta kinda think it through. They didn't have the banking system, and if they did, I'm gonna give you a little, I'm going to give you guys a little caveat. If they did, they sure didn't trust the Romans to keep safeguard their money, okay? You you, you were saying, you said, here, here, Romans, watch my money for me. They're like, cool, <laughs> we watch your money. Okay? FDIC, FDIC, uh, you know, certified, you know, insure, guaranteed. But you understand what I'm saying. So they didn't have a system we have, but you get the gist. Okay, verse number three. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liber your liberality unto where? So we know who, who the saints are. Now watch this. Paul says, you guys take the collection over the next year. You guys have some faithful brothers you can trust. Don't, you don't want no people like Judas. <laughs> you want some people who you can trust. When I get there, they, I, I'll, I'll commend them. Well, let's, let's read it. Verse number three. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, they need letters of accommodation, say, hey, we trust this guy. Then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Verse number four. And if it be meet, that I will also, they shall go with me. Now watch this. This was a constant thing. As long as this was a transitional thing, but as long as the little flock existed, the Gentile members of the body of Christ were to take this collection and constantly send for their needs. That makes sense? Because what happens? Paul didn't know how long the dispensation of grace would, would last. He didn't know how long the, the little flock would live. You had members of the little flock in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. 
Many of those members of the little flock, 1 Corinthians 15, were still, still around, and many of them lived past Paul. Therefore, as long as there was at least one member of the little flock on this earth, the, the, the Gentile's duty was to provide for his needs, or her needs. That's what Peter said at that conference. Yeah, yes. They were still... Okay, you go to the... Jews, Jews, we'll go to the Jews, but just remember us, the poor. Just yeah. remember the poor. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Not only that, Dorothy, Galatians 2.10, Paul says, I was going to do this, Peter, and, and I thought about doing it before you even mentioned it. I was, I was already up working on it. God is so wonderful. we got to have a look here. God is so wonderful. God knew the needs of the little flock. Sure, he told him to sell them. He knew, God knew that he would have Paul take collections constantly from us, from the Gentile churches to provide for them. Peter is like, what are we going to do? Paul says, don't worry, God already been thought it through. God is wise. Now, we have to end, but today, you don't need to give, uh, this question comes up, so, do we give to Israel? Yeah. You know, you bless Israel, Abraham comes and says, you bless Israel, the seed of Abraham, God will bless you. And that's just nonsense. Because let me tell you something. That's in prophecy when the Hebrew people got respected the person of them and their circumcision in the law. Once they rejected the blessing of God, their Messiah, and once God's word through Paul went out to the Gentiles, well, let me start right here. Once the, the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah as a whole, but only a few, the little flock, God stopped looking at Israel as a nation and looked at the little flock. God provided for the little flock through members of the body of Christ. But once the little flock died off, there's no need to take a collection for a little flock. You don't have to, it, it's good politically to bless Israel. They're the closest as far as the, the world system. You know, I'm talking about the Israel over there now. But that's not to get God's blessing. Those leaders reject Jesus Christ. I told you on Wednesday, I would like to talk to the prime minister of Israel, uh, what's his name? Netanyahu. Yeah. And tell him to get on his knees and repent for his people like Daniel that they killed their Messiah, but he won't believe that. So you don't have to do that. You can do it politically, but it's no spiritual advantage to blessing Israel today. That's only in prophecy. Outside of dispensation. There's no little flock today, technically. The closest thing we get are messianic Jewish congregations, like I mentioned earlier, but that's not what God's doing today. They should be members of the body of Christ. If the rapture happens today, they will be the new little flock. Then it would be advantageous spiritually to bless them, but not today. So you don't need to do... Why wouldn't they go up with us? Because a lot of them aren't trusting Jesus Christ shed blood. Oh. They're trusting their own Jewishness and the fact that he's the Messiah. That's the difference. Okay. Okay, and we'll talk more about that if you need. So, uh, blessing a Messianic Jewish congregation is not spiritually beneficial to anybody today. Therefore, because there's not a little flock to bless financially, what God focuses on today is grace ministry, the minister ministry of grace. And so, what he's talking about here, taking it to Jerusalem, we don't need to do that today. Today, you, you, you just provide for the grace ministry. That's what he's talking about, okay? Alright, let's, uh, um, we have we have one minute. I want to get to Second Corinthians, another passage Paul talks about. Go to Second Corinthians eight. We'll pick up this next week. It's a beautiful picture of how God provided, not just for the needs of the little flock, but simultaneously for the needs of the apostle Paul and those who need it in grace. Look at chapter eight, verse one. Now there's no way we're gonna get through all of this, but I'll just I'll just read it for down a few. Here's what I want you to see. Look at verse one, second Corinthians. Moreover, brethren. We do you to wit, that means to know, being witting, to know, of the what? Grace of God bestowed on the churches of what? Macedonia. Yes. Alright, so as we end, I want you to see something we're going to pick up next week. Interesting. Paul says that these churches of Macedonia, God bestowed upon them his grace. Now, it's a particular thing he did. This is fantastic. Be here. He gave them an opportunity to have fruit abounding to their account. I'm talking about like, it's like if somebody says, hey, I got the newest, uh, <laughs> I got the, uh, one, one of uh, my, my, my brother-in-law, Christmas brother, we were out with his family, uh, 
And his wife was telling us about some new thing that's coming about, coming from Europe and stuff. She's all in. She knows all this stuff. And she was like, it caught on in Europe, and the boy is going to catch up with America. America don't want it. Behind, like, you know, she's all into it. This is her business. And I'm, and I'm like, look, Krista, we need to take a little money and put it into that. Cause this gonna, she's like, it's a, anyway, people say it. But you know. But here's one that you know is going to work. God is like giving the, 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 the saints a little stock tip in advance. And hey, you want a word to round your account real fast? Watch this. Look, look at this verse. And I'm going to show you. You gotta be with us next week to see what it is. It's, it's definitely something that I saw. I was like, wow, watch this. Verse 8. More of a brethren, we do you to know. Paul says, we want you to know about the grace of God that's bestowed on the church. Churches of Macedonia. I have to end it so much. Paul says, hey, you should know this. God did it with those guys in Macedonia. You guys need to know this so you guys can get in on this yourself. It's like, hey, I gotta stop that. Paul is saying, watch what God is doing. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit or to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, they were going through the sufferings of Christ for the, for, for the grace of mystery. Watch this. The abundance of their joy, they started working this dynamic of suffering and glory. He talked, he's going to talk, he talked about in chapter 4. And their deep poverty, these people were, I mean, deep poverty, you know what it's like here in Second and in our area of California, you know. Deep poverty, abounding unto the riches of their liberality. That issue of abound, we got to end. Something is going on with these churches and how they partook in giving to the grace ministry. I'm going to let you know how important that is. Be- if, if, you, if this is what you want to be a part of, because there's something about investing that God and Paul are talking about in, in the grace ministry. He called it the grace of God. We'll pick it up next week. It's so profound that no matter what, if it's just between you and God, you work it out. Even if it's a little bit, it's not the quantity, it's what how God prospered. Like, here's how important that is to God. That even if you, like that widow's might, she didn't give a lot, but I'm going to tell you something what the Lord said. She, he said, that little bit she gave was more than all those rich guys. Combined. Remember that? He says, it's going to be a memorial for that woman, both in heaven and earth. People, that we're talking about it to this day. To the, she didn't even know that God was looking. That widow didn't know. She didn't know she was in the Bible. She didn't know she was be written in God's Word. I'm saying, it just takes that little bit. But it means so much to God to support His grace. Because it was a blessing for Him to put this on them. Alright, look at here. Verse 3. For to their power, that's their ability. So we're going to see it's whatever your ability is. You got to be willing and able, willing and able to their power. Here we go. Well, watch this. They even did beyond. Verse number three. For to their power, I bear record. Paul knew this. God told him. Yea, and beyond their power or ability to give, they were what? Willing of themselves. Now, verse 4, we got in, praying us with much entreaty. Let me, let me give you another word for that. They begged us. They got it. They got it. They understood. They saw the dynamic of the little bit that they invested, how God would multiply that. And you're going to see Paul use that word. Oh, bow. Get it? Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. That's this large sum of money that they... Anyway, and take upon us the fellowship. Oh, you got to get this. The fellowship of what? Of ministering to the saints. Now we we're at the end. Let me let me sum it up. These people knew what God was doing, and they said everything they gave to take care of God God's people back there, the rural flock in particular. And now the dynamic is great ministry today. It was a, it was a chance of a lifetime. Now here, let me end it like this. You see this word fellowship, fellows in a ship? Here's what he's saying. The fact that they were even involved in that. They were poor and they were like, oh no, we're not missing this. The fact they were involved in that fellowship of giving. They understand that all the fruit that came from that would abound to their account. In other words, everything associated with Paul's ministry, I can't even put it into words. 
When, when you're part of a Pauline Grace ministry that speaks the truth like this, all of that stuff abounds to your account. Everything that this ministry accomplished, get this, everything that we accomplished over the course of time as the Lord tarried, it abounds to your individual account. Like this one here. Like this one here, yeah. That's what I'm saying, Jim. You only do your little part, little, but it means so much to God, especially in giving, in giving that thing up. You just look at the verses. You read it yourself. We'll go over it next week. I'm saying that you understand what they understood. They said, hey, a little gets you a lot. <laughs> that little bit you give, it's abounding to your account. Everything that this ministry accomplishes, that's the word, abounds to your account positively, individually, at the, at the, to your reward. So in other words, it's more than just you, it's all of us, it's, it's like the ultimate pyramid. <laughs> Except you're the one on the top. <laughs> you know? That pyramid skin. Here's you up here. You're doing your little part. But everything it affects, it's just about unto you. I, I, you read it. We'll, we'll go through it. And the greatest way in that context was just anybody who gave a little bit to get the calling truth out. You know, when I say a little bit, give between you and God, with how God has taught you, you know. The fact is, whatever you gave, it doesn't matter how much. If it's given willing and ability, power, it's going to abound greater than what you think. That's the point. Any fruit that this ministry has brought forth, and I'm going to go so far as to say, the ministry that we were part of even back in Minnesota, because this is an extension of that. That's right. I mean, it's fantastic. I can't even see it, though. Well, I can see it, though. You can see, You get that. The little bit that you're doing for the truth, God is so... That's so important to God, and there's so many people who are resisting the truth, even in the body, that if you are willing and able, and you are part of that truth, like this ministry, everything that has been affected, all the fruit of this ministry abounds to your account individually. They are the top of the, yeah. the pyramid. Yeah. So much so, we got, we got it, we got it in. So much so, Dorothy, <coughs> that these people, you know what Paul is saying? They were such deep poverty. They were willing to say, Lord, this is, I don't have anything, but I'm gonna, because I get you, I see what you're doing. I'm gonna take my little bit and provide for those little flock, for that ministry, particularly the little flock, that's Paul. Because I realize, later Paul's gonna say, God, you do that, God's gonna provide for your needs, but also there's fruit that's just abound into your account. It's fantastic, I can't, it's the greatest stock tip you could ever get, put it like that. <laughs> okay? Alright, we gotta end. If no one ever loved you enough to ask you, you watch. Whether or not if you die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? Are you going to heaven or not? That's the question when you die. Everybody think they are, but not everybody's gone. You can know for sure. God sent the Apostle Paul in his love to say, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. You don't have to move a pr- muscle prayer, prayer, go to church, give a time. You don't have to do anything to be saved. You just trust the shed blood of Christ. If you believe Jesus died on the cross to take your sins, was, and, and, and God will save you that moment. Now, when we talk about the cross work, his death, his birth, his resurrection, the work of the cross, it's a completion. Jesus Christ paid it all. Now, you'll get saved if you do that by grace through faith plus no works. Now, after you're saved, what we've been talking about is what to do with the rest of your life. Those are where the good works come. The first good work is to build in the right doctrine. That's Paul. God wants you to know every word of the Apostle Paul. Romans 1 to 5, 11, 25. If you don't know it, that's what you do with your life. And believe it. When you do that, you'll be part of an active ministry. <coughs> if you're watching us today, that means, hey, you devoted your time. You can use your time, your talent, and your treasures to support the ministry and get it out to others. And all that fruit will bound to your account. And you'll get your reward as a difference in Christ. We want to help you with that, okay? All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in Him. We thank you that we can come together and be a part of what you're doing in this world. Amen. People ask all the time, where in the, what, what in the world is God doing? Well, He's doing the, the body of Christ. He's doing the grace and message, the mystery. We're thankful that we can be a part of that, Father. And Father, these truths that you bring out each and every day that we meet, both Wednesday and Sunday, And even as we read on our own, but particularly the preaching, there's a dynamic to preaching and teaching in the local assembly. We ask that these things take root, 
in our hearts that we believe it and that it might be fruit that abounds to our account and for your glory. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to give in, 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 in ways uh, beyond what we can even imagine, Father, and what we can receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive, the Lord said. Thank you that we can give of ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasure, all for your glory and the mystery, knowing that we'll get a reward back beyond what we can ever uh, uh, think, uh, uh, ask or even think. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.